Well then, let's wrap up this crazy party, shall we? Gotta clean up the mess father left behind. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to Let's Play Devil May Cry 3, mission number 18, Invading Hell. Mission 18 begins with one of my favorite combat sequences in the game. I think this one coming up is pretty ingenious. It's one of the most creative arenas in Devil May Cry as a series as a whole. It's hectic, there's a lot going on, there's a lot to watch out for, and there's a lot to manage. And it's also a pretty good gimmick. Yes, the arena that I'm referring to is the chessboard encounter. We have all of our damn chess pieces that we encountered so far, along with a king and a queen to round things out. My only gripe, as you can see right now, while they're all dark and grayed out, is that the pieces can become inactive at random, making them invulnerable. And your hits tend to clang right off them. Just glance off. Uh, it can be annoying at best, uh, when they go inactive at inopportune times, it can really halt your momentum. Aside from that, though, like I said, I think this is kind of an ingenious arena. They went through a lot of trouble to make each chess piece behave similarly to their actual uh, counterparts, too. Like the pawns, for instance, uh, you saw one of them make it to the other end of the board and get promoted to, uh, they usually get promoted to rooks, I think that one turned into a rook. On higher difficulties, I think they can actually turn into queens, which is also, I think, the highest, uh, promotion that, uh, pawn can get in actual chess. Uh, this, by the way, is the queen. Even the movements of each piece, uh, are also like rough approximations of how their real world counterparts can move. Uh, the queen, you can see, rotates towards Dante, locks on, and there we go, got it out of the way. She can move any number of spaces in a straight line towards him, and it's telegraphed by that purple line that was on the ground before uh, when she's coming at you to give you a big hug. Uh, the rooks, you've been seeing them castle with the king. Although I think they ignore most of the, the rules for castling. Like, castling is supposed to follow a bunch of really specific rules, but I give them a pass on that because I don't even remember all of the conditions for uh, Rook to Castle. And this final piece is the king. Final new piece, most important one on the board, of course. Ah, man. Doing a lot of castling. If I take out all the rooks, that will become less of a problem, but I, I'll probably spend more time going around taking all the rooks out anyway. And then we have the knights and the bishops and all that stuff that we've already met. Uh, aside from allowing the king to castle a little bit, the rooks don't do too terribly much. Uh, if you get too many pawns promoted into rooks, they can become a asshole. Uh, because they could just take up a lot of space on the board with lasers. And it just adds to the chaos, the hecticness of this whole situation. Should get, should be pretty close to dealing with the king, though. And once you, there we go, once you break the king, you win the game. King goes down and it is checkmate. Now on to the MC Escher bit. <laughs> Uh, this part is still pretty cool. Uh, so what we have coming up next, Mission 18, aside from that one encounter, is uh, a big refight chapter. It's the boss refight chapter. So we have all these MC Escher-esque stairways going up and down and sideways and upside down. You have a little bit of health scattered around. You have this statue down here where you change your loadout. Uh, you have like three green orbs total, maybe two, so you can refill in between boss fights. And you have to defeat between four and five, 
Uh, every boss in the game is here, plus an additional one. Actually, no, every boss minus Jester, including uh, the Hell Vanguard, kind of gets its own chapter here. So we're going to start with Gigapede. The moment it emerges from its hole, I'm going to show off uh, something cool. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to do this, Doppelganger. Doppelganger creates a clone of yourself. If you hit L1, you can stagger your Doppelganger's attacks, so your timings are different. Look at all that damage. Holy fuck. Uh, I guess it's handy for juggles, I suppose. Even cooler about Doppelganger is that uh, if you have a second controller, Player 2 can take control of the Doppelganger clone. And if you combine that with Dante's infinite Devil Trigger costume, you have a permanent co-op partner, if you like. Uh, so for the most part, I'm just going to be taking on enemies that we have already fought, but I'm going to try to find some kind of loadout or new technique to show off in each fight. So that there's something drastically different about each one. And for that same reason, uh, yeah, let me just grab that. I mean, I took, like, a glancing hit from Gigapede, but... I don't anticipate too much trouble from any of these bosses. Uh, Agni and Rudra might hit me a little bit, Cerberus might hit me a little bit, but... This is not gonna be a big deal. So who am I not fighting? Uh, I'm not f I'm not refighting Doppelganger, I'm not refighting Beowulf, and I'm not redoing, uh, Garyon. Right now, let's head to Leviathan, because I already have the loadout for him. Come on, wimp. So, with uh, Leviathan, the strategy that I'm using is going to be pretty similar, albeit a lot more optimized, uh, unlike the first fight, which I got pretty sloppy with. I've had time to refresh myself on a lot of stuff over the course of the Let's Play, which is kind of nice. My play's been getting a little more optimal as time goes on. Uh, Swordmaster would be really nice for him, because it would just let me float and glide in the air a little bit more easily. Remember, his core is still exposed while he's doing his laser, so that's a good chance to get a bunch of attacks in with Aerial Cross. And we can get that Doppelganger in. Mmm. Oh my god. It's so good. Remember, this fight... Probably took about a minute, minute and a half the first time we fought him. If not more, maybe two or three minutes. Fill a little Devil Trigger gauge off these guys. And he'll get one more set of laser attacks, but he will be dead before he finishes that. Now from here on out, we're going to skip running around to each boss, and I'll just cut directly to them, because I have to do a bunch of running back and forth to the Divinity Statue to change loadouts, then up and down stairs, so... We'll just be right back with the next boss. For the third boss, we're going to refight Agni and Rudra. Again, I'm going to employ a similar strategy as before, except now... Ah! Oh, yes! Except with that little addition of the Royal Guard at level 3. Uh, parrying is just the easiest, most effective way to get damage in. It's, it remains that way, I think, in this fight, but you can pour some extra damage on with level 2 or higher Royal Guard. And a helpful advanced technique called Guard Jumping, which I'm going to do again. Just wait for it. There we go, 1 and 2. So level 2 Royal Guard lets you guard in midair. And jumping, as we know by now, has a lot of iframes. A lot of invincibility when you jump. When you combine guarding and jumping, you get a huge window of opportunity to just... to, uh, to just guard. And if you fail that, you have the jump invincibility frames to fall back on to keep you safe. So you keep yourself safe while executing an otherwise precisely timed, risky just guard. And you get all that free rage for successful guards, and since we can't do much when the twins jump up and ground pound anyway, it's free rage and then uh, free damage after you parry them. 
So it's a way of supplementing that parry strategy we've been using for uh, for Agni and Rudra before. And one and two. Oh, so many of them. I'm pretty sure the uh, the mid air just guard ha uh, has a bigger window to it. Which just makes it that much better. Like I think it's uh, you have more frames to hit a just guard as a per uh, opposed to a regular guard in midair. Could be wrong about that. We'll get one more of those. There goes Agni. Oh, am I gonna get Rudra before? Oh no, he's gonna get into his other phase. I should have used a Devil Trigger explosion actually, and have the presence of mind because of the commentary. Ah, well. It's not like he's gonna last too terribly long. <laughs> Unfortunately, the transition cutscene's not skippable. And you just have to jump to avoid that. Yeah, jump right at the end of the cutscene, because the attack is coming. <laughs> Next up, we have Cerberus, the game's first gatekeeper. Now that we have some toys to play with, let's ruin him. First off, we got Agni and Rudra still. Because that part's obvious. Fire weapon, ice boss. We're keeping our shotgun, because that proves a really effective way of removing his ice armor. And it can keep us floating in midair. And we have switched to Swordmaster, because I want to show off a particularly deadly level 3 Swordmaster ability. So that is called Twister. It crazy combos here into something called Tempest. If you do it right, you can do something called Ultimate Tempest, which is devastating. It, it extends the length of the Tempest ability, uh, which means more damage, more ticks of the fire. So when you start mashing the style button for the crazy combo, uh, you'll see a little white flash and then Dante will go into the air and start spinning. If you stop mashing style and start hitting attack at the exact right moment, that's what extends the Tempest and makes it ultimate Tempest. It's kind of hard to do. I don't think I quite pulled it off correctly. But, uh, it's pretty devastating, especially for fire vulnerable bosses with three spots that can get hit at the same time. The main difference between when we fought Nibon before and how we're gonna fight her now is that instead of using Aerial Cross with Agni and Rudra, we're gonna use a level 3 Swordmaster ability again, this time with Beowulf. That is called a real impact. It's a giant charged uppercut that depletes her shield right away. And if you time it correctly, she does not even get to spin. Holy shit, it feels so good. You can also crazy combo real impact in midair to do a little tornado kick. So it goes from a Shoryuken basically into a Tatsumaki. Ah. One real impact is all it takes to break her guard down, though. Then you can go into a shot with Spiral to knock her down. And just lay waste to her with Cerberus as before. Oh, she teleported out of it. That's kind of rare. Oops. That was a bad input. She'll electrify the floor, which gives me plenty of time to set up for this. Oh, no, she didn't spin. When she doesn't spin, uh... For some reason, the real impact just doesn't work properly to break the shield. That's not too bad. Like, Cerberus is really good against her, even aside from uh, the, the utility of real impact. Straight is good against her. Killer B is really good against the shield. Helps you get across the room faster when she switches sides. Ah, so much utility to have in Beowulf here. Even though it's a weapon that she's not technically weak to, it's still really good against her. Come and get 
Uh, was she too far away for that taunt? I think she, yeah. Charge up straight. Go right in. Oh, I was too far away for the, the Devil Trigger explosion to pop her shield off. That's another way to break her shield is to use a Devil Trigger explosion. Which is weird because I got the style points for hitting her with it, but it didn't actually penetrate the shield. It didn't even touch the shield. It's like she was too far away. Ooh. Oh. God. <laughs> uh, let's go to plan B then. I didn't have enough Devil Trigger for uh, the explosion the first time, but a helpful hint for this last phase of Navon since it's harder to break her shield now. Just wait for her to rush at you for the big hug attack and then explode. And it stops her from grabbing you and also uh, leaves her stunned. And this is the last one that we're going to do. Uh, this is mission two, actually, uh, where we fought the Hell Vanguard is sort of a mini boss. This time there are two of them plus some grunts. Like I said, I'm not redoing Doppelganger, Beowulf, or Garyon because they're either too slow or I don't have anything new to show off for them. One thing I do want to add while we're here, though, is that you, if you need to level a style up to level 3, this is the mission to do it in. It only takes a couple replays of this mission to get all four of your styles up from level 1 to level 3 because each boss gives you 7,000 style points. So this one, uh, this is just a good chance to, to freestyle it and go to town before heading into the last two boss fights and to enjoy some things like the amazing feel of real impact when you get a chance to land it. That name is no joke either. The impact is real. That move is like the dictionary definition of good game feel. Like, game feel is a lot of things. It's sound effects, it's screen shake, it's how enemies reel back when they take a hit, it's the hit sparks and other effects. And then some of it is hit stop. What is hit stop? It's how many frames that the screen freezes for uh, when you whack someone. If you have too few, then attacks wind up feeling kind of limp. If you have too many, then combat becomes sluggish. But when you get it just right, it makes hits feel like they have the perfect impact. And Devil May Cry is really, really good about game feel. And it generally uses very few frames of a hit stop for fast weapons. And maybe like four frames for the heavier stuff, like uh, Beowulf hits, especially like straight and charged uh, uppercuts and stuff. But with real impact, there's like a full quarter of a second. And it just feels like you have knocked whatever you hit out, like a good KO. I love that stuff. A really good example of, of amazing hit stop is uh, Little Max KO Punch in Smash 4. Game feel is one of the most important aspects of gameplay, but it's also one of the most overlooked or overtly unrecognized. Uh, it's Hmm, how do I want to say this? It's the foundation that gameplay should be built on. Because it's so important for a game to just feel good. If it feels bad to hit the buttons, the rest of the game tanks. I don't care how good everything else is. It has to feel good to hit buttons. Like, just the basic act of, of doing all of your... getting all your shit in. <laughs> It's gotta feel good. It's gotta feel right. Which is why I'm always so quick in Let's Plays to point out, like, oh, this game feels so good, or this or that feels great. It's also one of those things that's counterintuitive, uh, just from a Let's Play standpoint. Or watching someone play a game. Like, game feel, you can understand from watching. You can, uh, you, like, you can watch something and say, yeah, this game feels good even without the controller in your hands. And that's all we need to uh, move on out of the mission. So that's going to do it for now. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy. Have a good one.
Thank <laughs> you.